All right, Mike, now you're going to go in that basement and you're going to film a video. And everybody's going to love it. And no one's going to play it on 2x speed so you sound like a chipmunk. But I got no confidence with all this entropy in my hair. There. Ah, oh, this stuff is awesome. All right, now go down there and edutain those people. Actually, I need this camera. I need the camera. Well, hi everybody. Hi, I'm Mike here, and I'm, I'm much more confident now that I've lowered the entropy of my hair. I haven't combed my hair in, in eight days, so uh, you know that's the thing about teaching from home. So uh, I'm jacked. I'm I'm jazzed. I'm uh, bedazzled to talk to you about entropy, which is a thing that gives processes in nature a little nudge towards whether they're going to be spontaneous or not and it's a factor in whether something's going to be spontaneous it is the measure of the disorder or randomness of the system so it has the symbol s s with a little uh, degree sign over it means standard entropy at 25 degrees and at one mole and one atmosphere and here's a bunch of data for you okay here's this is out of the out of the open stacks book and now you've got delta h and you got delta g and over here on the right we've got some values of entropy and uh, you'll notice that the units are a little bit different instead of everything in kilojoules per mole it's in joules per kelvin Per mole and then if we look at some values all right let's look at some values like say for water here's water liquids entropy and maybe I should focus in a little bit more on it if we go and take a look at water's entropy value um, here we are 70 but that's water liquid so water liquid has less disorder than water gas vapor if you will and that is a value of 188.8 where the liquid is 70 so uh, and we can always just use those values later but I'm going to get that textbook out of the way and say that we can make the sweeping generalization that the entropy of a gas is much more uh, than the entropy of a liquid which is much greater than the entropy of a solid. Why? Well, you, you know a lot about the three states. Uh, gases are very random. They're moving around randomly. Uh, they have a lot of disorder. Liquids, somewhat random, but the molecules are stuck together in layers that slide along each other. And then entropy of a solid, they're stuck in a crystal structure. If they're crystalline solid, and they just kind of rattle around in place. Of course, at 25 degrees where the values are in your table nothing has an entropy of zero or a standard entropy of zero because everything has some molecular motion to it everything has some level of randomness or disorder so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how entropy which by the way is not measured directly you can measure delta h with a calorimeter you can measure delta g but you can't measure entropy. There's no such thing as an entropometer or something like that. So we're going to talk about delta S of processes. So this would be of a reaction like we're going to talk about. And what we could do is those table values I just saw you, I just showed you, we could just subtract them, right? Products minus reactants and we could figure out what is delta S of the process. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is the system becoming more disordered, less disordered? And so uh, this is what I, like I said, a partial predictor. It's going to be the thing that may give things a nudge to being spontaneous or not. In some cases, it's the thing that drives it. Diffusion drives uh, is driven by entropy. The fact that gas is spread out. Uh, Osmosis is driven uh, by entropy. So uh, we're going to figure out from looking at things using a scientific process we call looking at it, if a system is becoming more disordered or not. 
delta S positive, that means that the products have more disorder than the reactants, that would be delta S positive. Delta S negative means the products are becoming more ordered than the reactants. And we have one big thing that will help us is if we know what state everything is in. So here we go, practice time, whoop, whoop, practice time, whoop. Let's try to predict the sign of delta S of the reaction. So we're going to look at this thing. That's hydrogen peroxide and it's uh, producing water. Now these are both liquids, but look, we're making a gas. So anytime, you know, gases are sort of like the absolute highest in entropy. And so I could say, well, since we're making a gas, and another thing here, we've got a pure substance becoming a mixture, which sounds like a more uh, random disordered thing to you, a pure substance where there's only one kind of molecule or a mixture. So we got two things pushing this and the factor of delta S here is going to be positive. That's all we need to know for now. Is it going uh, positive or negative? And that's going to lead up to something we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes. Here's another one. That is hydrogen gas mixed with oxygen gas becoming water molecules. And you can do that if you combine these two and then you light a match to it. Uh, you'll have a process that happens very quickly, but let's look at it. What's more disordered, reactants or products? I agree with your thought. It is the reactants that are more disordered. Not only are they gases where the products are liquids, that's a mixture, that's a pure substance. This is a delta S negative. The reacted, the products are more ordered or less disordered than the uh, reactants are. Here is, we're going to go and melt an ice cube. And what's going to happen to the entropy here? Well, delta S is going to be, well, liquid has less randomness than, uh, oh, excuse me, liquid has more randomness than the solid crystal structure of ice. So in this case, I'd say going from solid to liquid, once again, I'm leaning on this, right? Solids have more, uh, less entropy than liquids do. Liquids are more disordered. Uh, therefore, the products have more disorder than the reactants. Reactants minus products, this would be a delta S positive. Fair enough? Okay, tricky one coming up next. Here we go, our last one for doing the prediction of the sign of delta S. Here is making ammonia. Everything's a gas. So that's a, that's a wash, right? But once again, what you got here is not only is this a mixture, but you have number of moles too. I'll show you another example later. So think of this. How many more random combinations are you going to get uh, if you shuffle a bunch of cards, if you shuffle two decks of cards, or three plus one is four decks of cards. So there's two factors here that are making it look like the entropy of this process, the change of entropy, is negative. One, you've got a mixture making pure substance. One, you've got four moles making two moles. And so an increase in the number of moles will give you more combinations like, uh, like decks of cards. And so folks, this is a delta S that is negative. Even though everything's a gas, we can determine that that's an entropy change of negative. So it's really pretty easy once you get some practice. You're just using your imagination, not really using your imagination, you're leaning a lot on what phase something is, is whether it's a mixture or a pure substance. And then finally, maybe the tiebreaker is how many moles. Now, why do we care? The reason we care is it's going to help us predict why is something product favored or reactant favored or spontaneous or non-spontaneous, whichever term you prefer. Let's talk about Gibbs free energy next. Nothing to do with the Bee Gees. I wish I could play Bee Gees music there, but it's all copyrighted. And we want to keep my YouTube channel staying alive, staying alive. Uh, 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 uh. So here we're going to talk about Gibbs 
free energy, that is the other little column of things in that, that table in the, in, the, in the textbook I showed you. There was delta H, there was uh, S, and there is uh, Gibbs free energy of formation. So this is actually the predictor of what is going to be spontaneous or not. So it's kind of a big deal. By the way, I just kind of fished out my book there and you can see that this uh, here table is, uh, you know, listing. This is delta H, that's delta G, Gibbs free energy, there's entropy. Okay, back to what we were talking about. So you can look up the values of these in terms of Gibbs free energy, but let's first explain what the heck it is. This is the sole predictor of what makes something uh, spontaneous or not. And it's a culmination of enthalpy, delta H, and entropy, delta S. So here's the deal. If delta G of a process is negative, that's what we call product favored or spontaneous. Spontaneous is an older term that's becoming somewhat outdated because molecules aren't spontaneous. They're not just like, hey, let's go skinny dipping. No, they always do the same kind of predictable thing. So this term is a little bit out of favor, but I like saying it's spontaneous and non-spontaneous. But you can just say that something is spontaneous is like pushing a boulder down a hill. It's going to favor the formation of the products. Something that is non-spontaneous is like pushing a boulder up a hill. Doesn't mean it's impossible, just means it's an uphill climb for nature. Now, we were just done talking about E zeros. There's a little equation relating delta G, which is sometimes measured from E zeros of reactions. And you notice, remember, if E zero of a cell is positive, that means it was spontaneous, and there's a negative in this equation. So you could say, okay, if delta G is negative, that means spontaneous, even though delta uh, uh, E zero is positive means spontaneous. They're both related to each other by uh, minus n number of electrons in the Faraday constant. So here's what the deal is, folks. Let's skip a whole bunch of calculus and get to our main weapon. Uh, delta G is determined by, as we said earlier, entropy, it's over here in this term, enthalpy, back from Gen Chem 1, delta H, and temperature, which must B in Kelvin. Always got to have it in Kelvin, and I'll, you'll see why. So let's look in and soak in that equation. Delta G is delta H minus T delta S. Does that mean that everything is exothermic is going to be delta G negative? No. That, that just helps, but you've got this term is negative, and what if delta S is negative? That's going to end up being a minus, a negative, and a plus, a positive, and that will make delta G sway positive. See? So sometimes this term here, the delta H and the T delta S, are fighting each other. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a bunch of examples, and we're going to test things out. What if we had a process where something was delta H positive, and delta S positive. Would it be spontaneous? Would it not be spontaneous? Or is it one of those things where we're not sure yet? Here's a great example. This process is delta H positive. It takes 44 kilojoules per mole to vaporize water. We're going to talk about that one later. And um, it is an increase in entropy because gases are more random than liquids. So is this spontaneous? And you know that it kind of depends. Why is that? Well, because delta H being negative, uh, excuse me, positive, would make this delta G positive. But if delta S is positive, like is with vaporization of water, this term is positive, but it's a minus. So this will be a positive minus something positive. It depends on the value of T. I'm going to say maybe. And maybe if you're really good at looking at this thing, you could say, well, the bigger T is, the more likely it's going to swing uh, to negative, right? And to make this term bigger, and it's a minus. Uh, how about another scenario? We got three, we got four scenarios here. What if uh, we have 
delta H negative and delta S positive. What's that going to end up being like? And what's a good example of that? A uh, combustion of anything, generally. And so what you got going on here is that is delta H negative. This is the combustion I put of octane. So something like gasoline. Uh, you will notice that you have all gases on the right side of the reactants and just some gas on the left and in the liquid. You have, let's see, 12 and a half plus one is 13 and a half moles on the left and you got 17 moles on the right. That's delta S positive and it's certainly exothermic. Hey, check it out. I can make an explosion happen right on the screen. Watch this. Yeah, see? That's, that's kind of like the same sort of situation. So, let's plug this in. Delta H negative makes delta G tilt negative. Delta S being positive makes this term, just like the last example, uh, negative. And so this is always going to give you a result where delta G will be negative. It's impossible. It doesn't even matter what T is. Yeah, so you go to absolute zero and you go light a match to something that'll combust, it'll still happen. That's the way you can look at it. What about the opposite? Look, if we flip those two, doesn't that make um, the exact opposite thing happen? Yeah. And so what would happen here, what if something was delta H positive? That would swing delta G positive. What if it was delta S negative, that would be minus a negative, no matter what T is, in Kelvin it's just something above zero, that would be a positive minus a negative. This would be never spontaneous. And does that mean it can't happen? No, but it means it's going to be a real uphill climb for nature. Check out that. This is something that's delta H positive because that's ozone. That is not a stable compound, uh, not a stable molecule at all. So that's a very endothermic process. You'll notice that there's two pure substances on each side. They're both gases, but uh, they have different number of moles. There's two moles on the right, three moles on the left. More moles means more randomness. This, my friends, is something delta S negative and delta H positive, and it is not spontaneous unless you have huge amounts of energy like lightning, right? That's where ozone is formed and then it rains and then, yeah, I, I see, it's just you, you can't compete with the fancy doodads. So uh, this is, um, uh, uh, you know, something that happens and then you smell it. Like, hey, I smell the ozone, it just started to rain. And then it gets dissolved in the, in the water, so in the rain water. Last scenario, folks. What if something was uh, delta H negative and delta S negative? Let's feed that into the equation here, right? So what we got going on is delta H is negative. That helps delta G be negative. But delta S is negative, that would be minus a negative, make it positive. And so maybe it depends on the temperature. Both of these maybes depend on T. That one and that scenario. Case in point, now we're going to go and we're going to freeze ice. That is actually exothermic. It happens at a cold temperature, but orange farmers know that's exothermic because you've got to take out uh, some number of kilojoules per mole. You've got to take the energy out of the, uh, of the liquid water to freeze it, and it's delta S negative. Does it happen at all temperatures? No. Uh, I think I know what temperature it happens at when I put water in my freezer that temperature, but it doesn't happen at every temperature possible. So there you have a little bit of, uh, that, that's the scenario of everything in the universe that can happen, folks, and why it's either always spontaneous, never, or it depends on temperature. Now, let's do some practice and then we'll get you out of here. More practice, whoop, whoop, more practice, whoop. That's the more practice alarm. 
Here's something, oh boy, look, we were, I told you we were going to talk more about this later. If the delta H for the process, which by the way is the vaporization of water, right, liquid to gas, if that's positive 44 kilojoules per mole and delta S is positive 118 joules per mole per Kelvin, both of them positive, that's one of those things that's a maybe. At what temperature conditions will it be spontaneous? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take our killer equation here, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now when does this become spontaneous? When delta G crosses zero or lower. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put zero in here. Zero equals delta H minus T delta S. Oh, geez, Mike. Delta H minus T delta S. Why don't we go and subtract from both sides of the equation a delta H? So then what's going to happen is minus delta H equals minus T delta S. Solving for T, why? Because they asked about it. They asked what temperature. Uh, I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to get rid of, how about that? Too much negativity in the world anyhow. I'm going to go ahead and solve for T. T would be to divide both sides by delta S. So let's go and do that, delta S. So it's kind of funny. T equals delta H over delta S. Now, folks, I'm going to do the wrong thing. This is what we call in science the wrong thing. I'm going to do the wrong thing because look at the units. Joules here, kilojoules here. And so what I got going on is if I do this, let me do it over here. Wrong. All right. If I go and put 44 kilojoules per mole, and then I divide that by 118.8 joules per mole per Kelvin. Kilojoules and joules don't get along. So what I got to do is I got to either convert my kilojoules to joules or nah, I feel like converting this to kilojoules. 1188 kilojoules. I divide it by a thousand. You guys have done that a gazillion times. So now when I do this, T equals uh, 44 kilojoules per mole divided by 0.1188 joules per kilojoules per mole per Kelvin. Looky what happens. Kilojoules cancel, moles cancel. I get 1 over 1 over Kelvins. And I get some number that I don't know yet because I haven't crunched it through my calculator, my TI-30XA. So 44 divided by 0.1188 is 370. I, don't know, I round it a little bit. 370 what? 1 over 1 over Kelvin. Okay, what's that in regular temperatures? Uh, take away 273 is 97 degrees Celsius. What's that sound like? Sounds like to me as the boiling point of water. That's when vaporization becomes spontaneous and there's complete bedlam because everything starts boiling in your pot of spaghetti. Now, how can I prove if it's got to be greater or less than 97? Because it says what conditions, conditions will it be spontaneous? Well, this was positive. This was also positive. And so the bigger T gets, the more it's going to swing delta G negative. So 97 is where it crosses zero, but when T is bigger, this negative term becomes bigger. So to answer my question very, very properly, I'm going to say at temperature greater than 97. That's when it's spontaneous. 
everything less than 97 will not. Now, of course, now you say, hey, the boiling point of water is 100. Ah, okay, I get it. I got these numbers out of the table, which is done at 25 degrees. So there's probably a little slop in there, and it's not exactly 100. But we all know that boiling of water becomes spontaneous at greater than its boiling point. And we just proved it with the Gibbs free energy equation. All right, there you go. Make sure your units of these two, delta H and delta S, are the same. Make sure your units of temperature are in Kelvin, and now you are invincible to anything that anyone will ask you about spontaneity or product favoredness or reactant favoredness. And it all depends on these three things. Enthalpy, temperature, and disorder. I don't know the lyrics. It's a 90s song. Um, I'll see you later. Uh, bye.